introduction of myself, I just want to say a special welcome to uh, some key people here. So first I'd like to introduce Trustee Mary Thorne Buckle. Thank you. And our beloved President Adrian. <laughs> the beloved VP of Admin Services. Thank you. I won't have a uh, coffee right today. It has been the trademark. <laughs> and then I wanted to introduce our two students, which I know we just did that anyway, but for those on Zoom, uh, we have two students who are in our student advisory group. So this group was really formed to make sure that our design was going to be student centered. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Ian and Danielle. <laughs> Um, I want to start today with a note of appreciation for everyone who participated in this process. So we've had over 85 people involved in our design process since July in this phase, which is amazing. When you consider how little time we all have, how much we all have going on, and the fact that we prioritize this work really says a lot about our culture and our values here at Coastline. I also would like to say a special thank you to two people in the room, to Kim Lee and to Juan Pena, you both raised your hand. <laughs> they do a ton of work to support all the groups throughout this process every time we have an event. And of course, I want to thank my partner in crime, Josh Lamentis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's the one who's maybe like the only one who might be as obsessed with pathways as I am. <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate all the work that you've done in helping provide this leadership. And the presentations you've seen here today are a direct result of his efforts. So I wanted to give you a quote that has been wandering around my mind for the past few months. That change is hard at first, messy in the middle, and gorgeous in the end. And I am really glad to be in the messy middle with all of you. <laughs> we uh, began this design team work at our retreat this summer, and we have continued it throughout the semester. The groups have been meeting regularly. They've been looking outside of not just coastline in our district, but really across the country at best practices. They've engaged with research, they've interviewed their colleagues, and we're really excited to be hearing from three different groups today on uh, their presentations and design proposals. So what we will do is we'll hear from each group, we'll do questions for each group, and then Dr. Adrian will have some summary remarks at the end, and we'll talk about next steps. And I am going to sit down <laughs> Thank you. So our first group is Learning Journey. I really don't think I need a mic. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm, my apologies for speaking really loud. No. But, um, <laughs> Not yours. Can you put it on the right slide? No, please, no, open that. They're all in one file. So just go to the yeah. right there. <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Our team entered into existence on the 30th of July, 2019. We walked into that building as a program mapping um, team, and we emerged as a learning journey component. So as you can tell um, from this particular group, we are a very dynamic and diverse and innovative team that are not afraid to take a risk. Yes, amen. <laughs> So I will let the team members introduce themselves and tell you where they're from. Joshua Leventus from Communication Studies and then also now the faculty coordinator for Guided Pathways or Coastline Pathways. Did I not introduce myself? No. <laughs> no. I'm Shermaine Harrell. I'm the Interim Dean for our Extended Learning Department. I'm Dan Weber, Articulation Officer, part of Counseling as well. 
My name is Alyssa Martinez, and I'm a student retention specialist. Jim West, Director of Admissions and Records. Rachel Marchioni, General Counseling with an emphasis in career. Oh, and Erin is not here, unfortunately. She couldn't be here, but she contributed just as much as well. All right, so we are going to talk about today um, the challenges and problems, the group departments that we consulted, recommendations, evidence and research, obstacles and challenges, resources, and the six success factors that contributed to our problem. Next slide. So we actually even have a mission. So at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, we want to be able to um, create academic turning points and memorable academic experiences that establish a continued connection to coastline. And the reason why we want to do this is, from experiences from high school, students take away what their prom was like, they take away how the football games were, all those things that don't really necessarily tie to academics and their GPAs. So when our students walk away from Coastline, we want that connection to be what they learned and how their experiences in their learning journey impacted their lives. So on to our next slide. So actually, um, the, the problems and challenges that we, we feel will come about are, are really a more of uh, just the growing aspect uh, of our college as we move through uh, the process in, in making our learning journeys uh, much, much more uh, concrete. So actually, um, Alyssa is going to talk a little bit about uh, the issues with engagement uh, in the learning journey itself. Of course, we know in the California Community College system, it's very piecemeal. Students choose classes based on what they think is interesting or what they think they should be taking, an English class here, a behavioral and social science class here. Not so much all the time if they don't see a counselor without direction. So the current problem right now with the learning journey is that we create this pathway for them, that they have a more predictable class schedule. That way, if they have a change of major, that way if they choose a different pathway, they didn't necessarily waste any time. We know that that's a persistent and retention issue amongst all community colleges because we know that it takes longer than the traditional two-year trajectory to transfer to a four-year if that is their academic goal. We know at this age we want to also create this pathway because at that age, 18, 19, if they're first, um, a first-time student, we know that at that age, what do we really want to know what we wanted to do? So having this pathway and this concrete, more predictable schedule of the college level English, these gateway classes, that way they're able to transfer out or create their um, complete their educational goal. We want to do this in a time, having these pathways encourages doing it in a timely manner. So because uh, our students don't always know what their career goals are, uh, they don't always know what courses to take, we feel that this is the, the primary goal of the learning journey. Uh, and so what our first idea is, uh, is creating some kind of uh, universal GE pattern for these students. Currently, Coastline does not highlight our regularly offered classes for our students in a coherent way. Uh, and so we want to update that uh, in order to avoid ineffective enrollment management issues, uh, to make sure that there's no confusion for students, uh, to mitigate the potential for stoppage in programs uh, for the student, and of course, the possibility of even withdrawal from their courses and unfortunately withdrawal from the college. Uh, so these are the, some of the major challenges and problems we see uh, currently with the non-highlighting of general education courses. Um, we talk about first year experience as being a problem. Currently, we don't have a way to categorize students. This is something we want to work really closely with the onboarding group. It's not that not particularly a high school graduate entering, but providing each there's going to be different retention effort for different populations of students amongst our campus. So we want to provide the appropriate first year experience for each or for each um, population of students. So we want to be able to do that within the learning journeys. So one, like I said previously, one of the groups and departments we want to consult with was onboarding. We feel that it's really important on um, not only the district um, application, but working with them, having a homegrown 
inventory or assessment. That way we're able to categorize students. That way we connect them to the appropriate resources here on campus and assisting them with helping them choose a pathway. We'll go over the pathways very shortly, but making sure that they have the correct and appropriate resources, helping them to persist with their specific journey. And of course, uh, as students move through, they need help from different groups. And of course, one of the helps uh, that students need primarily is from our counseling department. So uh, our group wanted to work very closely with counseling to determine, and we're lucky to have two, two counselors in our group, uh, to work in figuring out what a student needs to know before they get to a counselor, right? And so developing part of the learning journey is helping a student become educated on what it is uh, they need to know before they get to a counselor so they can make that appointment more efficient, right? Uh, in, a, in addition to working with counseling, we also want to consult the faculty regarding the general education pattern, the universal GE pattern that we've been talking about, uh, different program relevancy to students, uh, curriculum. There's a variety of things that faculty need to be involved in in this process, and we want to make sure that we're incorporating all the faculty voice from the different programs and departments. And then in regards to IT, we want to make sure that we have the appropriate resources, technological resources, to support these efforts, such, if, such as if we want to do a program mapping software like EduNav or any other ones. All right, so to the, the meat of our recommendations, next slide, please. Uh, so the, the first idea about a learning journey for our group was that it would be identified off of two specific things. First is the student's point of entry into the college, and the second their specified education goal. Uh, things that we would learn from the student prior to their entry, either on their application or during an orientation uh, type event, right? And so uh, the first journey, of course, would be the, the primary journey is the award-seeking student. And that, of course, includes uh, students with uh, no higher education coming straight, in, straight out of high school, uh, a returning student who might have taken some time off but is now coming back, uh, concurrent students specifically, students that we have in our ECHS program or our local high schools that are able to kind of uh, take classes at the same time. Uh, or what we call dual enrollment sometimes, as well as our certificate students uh, who are our non-career education certificate students, right? So these are the, the students that we, we've identified as award seekers in a variety of ways. Um, and so that would be one specific group. And that, of course, is the student that is potentially going to be transferring somewhere else or moving on to another institution. Uh, the uh, second uh, learning journey is the opposite. It's the non-award seeking mm -hmm. learner. This is the student who's perhaps coming for uh, a class just to uh, do some exploration. Uh, perhaps it's our, our, our ESL students, or perhaps it's maybe a student uh, who's here for a variety of reasons, but not really sure if they're here for any type of award, right? It's more along the lines of that, that swirling student, right? And so then the other, the other journeys will be discussed by Alyssa. Then we have learning journey three, which is the career education learner. That includes students that want to receive a certificate, perhaps to improve their current job skills, but are not looking to transfer, as well as examination preparation. Perhaps if they want to take the state accounting test so that they are CPA certified, that way they're taking prep courses here so that they're in pre preparing for that exam. Also, we have learning journey four, the four-year guest learner. We know that all of uh, larger population of our students are students elsewhere at either the four year or two year. So they're here as a guest student, they're here as a guest learner. They're gonna take their one or two courses, whether it's in the summer or fall or spring, and then go back to their home school. But we wanna provide the correct and um, necessary retention efforts and um, connecting them to the appropriate resources for them to be successful, whether they complete with us or not. Yeah, I, know. I think we kind of mix that one up a little bit, but also for that four-year guest learners, we want to open the door to make them our student, right? So not just that they are at another institution, but give them opportunities to complete something with us as well, right? So for example, if they're taking one course, we can introduce them to another second or potentially third course that gets them a certificate that gets us a benefit, but also them a benefit as well, right? So now we can move on to uh, our second recommendation, uh, which is our universal uh, GE pattern. Uh, and we're really thinking of 
the universal GE pattern being as appropriate to that uh, award-seeking student, the student who's looking to get uh, some type of certificate or degree. And really the idea of what we're calling a reverse funnel is starting the, the student off, regardless if they can identify a major at the beginning, that we want them first to identify their area of interest. In doing so, that also gives them the freedom and the flexibility to do a little investigation within their own area. So for example, Danielle is a student in, in uh, the, the science and technology and math area. Uh, perhaps as she takes a class uh, in, in biology and then decides to take a prerequisite in chemistry and says, wow, I really like chemistry now. Maybe I'm gonna switch my major over to something else. She's shaking her head, no, 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 it's not gonna happen. But <laughs> examples, 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 right? So again, it's, it's giving that student that option at the very beginning and then moving them through the universal GE pattern into their ultimate major goals. And Dan will discuss the universal GE a little bit further. Hello. Uh, yeah, so speaking about the way the pattern itself would look a little bit, uh, we're building it off the IGETSI pattern because that can filter backwards to the Cal State pattern and the native pattern that we use here, the three options. So an ideal student plan would look like a pattern that includes IGETSI versus option one, and then we would convert as needed. Any coursework built into the universal plan would be cross checked against all three patterns, therefore students wouldn't lose any time or lose any of their work if they did decide to change their goals as they went along. Um, the IGETSI really hits on those six areas, the seventh being the self-development, which we require as part of the degree and the Cal States requires, so that's kind of the seventh area. Um, this will help students navigate smoothly across their, their journey itself, also across like I said, different GE patterns as their plans might change, they want to mix and match. Um, it helps us highlight the courses that we use the most and the students access the most. So it'll make it a lot easier for us to be planning our curriculum, be able to plan the schedule out, get everything set up for enrollment management, much easier for the students and for the faculty and staff to make things work in conjunction. Um, another thing too, uh, a lot of people have mentioned that they're worried that this indicates that we're only ever gonna use IGETSI, we're gonna trim the courses down to the bare minimum. This isn't intended to remove courses, it's simply intended to give students an optimal plan, which can be adjusted as needed through counseling and advising and success. So it's not an intention to remove anything, it's just giving students an optimal pattern that will cover the most bases at the same time, essentially. So. Can I make a request from Zoom? If you stand in the middle, toward the middle, so they can see you. Stand between the two things. Yeah, otherwise they can't see. Can they even see the screen if I stand in front of it? There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, whichever camera we're looking at here. Uh, okay, so moving on. Moving on. Idea three. Ideas. Uh, do you want to talk first about it? Yeah. Okay. Not move on to the middle. So don't look so small. Move over there so don't look so small. Right. Um, so again, uh, the the second uh, or the third recommendation is that uh, our learning journey, especially our award seeking journey, should include a first year experience. Right. And the first year experience will actually have multiple components to it. Uh, the we are looking at the first year experience through an instructional lens. We understand that other areas, uh, other design groups like onboarding, uh, financial success, holistic wellness, will be looking at a first year experience through their lens. This is primarily through, again, an instructional lens. Uh, so the first thing is, of course, they'll be choosing their area of interest. Uh, and then we, we've discussed the ideas of creating both loose and intentional learning communities uh, that revolve through those areas of, of interest, right? Uh, and then, of course, that, that we would have things uh, that are instructionally related as part of the orientation or onboarding component, right? Uh, ideas of the overview of the Universal GE, helping out with perhaps abbreviated student ed plans, uh, again, preparing them to meet with, with counselors and front-loading with them information to make those appointments uh, much, much more effective. And then primarily, uh, the first year experience will be grounded in a first year experience course that Dan will now talk about. Oh, um, I'm coming back to the middle. Okay, so yeah, so talking about the first year experience course, it would not be a complete semester course as far as three units go. It's more like looking like possibly a two unit course. Uh, much more, less would we say eight, 
ish 10 weeks, 10 ish weeks, not a full 16 week course. It's much more uh, trying to bridge the gap between say with onboarding where it's how the campus works to here's what your journey is about and here's your exploration and here's where we're going with it to as you see in the second semester more the counseling 104 105 component where the student can have some information built into their their journey and then talk about more about their career options how to be successful on the collegiate side not so much how to register correctly but time management, whatever it might be in those regards. Um, I've got two different ideas in my head because in the counseling aspect of it, I've been speaking with Bruce about some ideas where we may even change how 105 exists so that it's more purposeful in that students can take components of the 105 course instead of a full course. So that's something that might be looked at down the road too with that. Um, uh, and that would be kind of the capstone course that we would use for the different students after that first semester. So. I right. think of anything else I left off there. Um, also, we're looking at the first year class of being much more of a seminar style in the way it's taught. Um, and then after that, obviously after the, the second semester, this is again the second semester in here, they'd still have another check-in afterwards. So at the end of the first year experience, all, all, sorry, all the way through these, we would have a milestone check-in point to see how students are progressing through their journey as well. And at the end of the first year, um, we would also be covering things like more career exploration, where they go from here, how transfer relates and how they get their applications completed, because obviously that after that first year, we're already starting to look at applications. Um, also going back and talking briefly about services, that's where we'd want to start getting the students involved with student success and all that good stuff too. I don't want to leave Danny out. Student orientation and registration. Yep. Sorry, we didn't spell that one out. Um, anything else we want to talk about with that? I think that's good. So going on to the next slide. Um, how are you defining first year? Are you defining it in terms of a calendar or units? We're currently defining it as. Can you repeat the question? Oh, how are we defining first year? So we're currently defining it as the first two semesters. It could have a different definition eventually, but currently it would be a standard one semester, two semester process. That's what we're looking at it currently. Um, and then we're going to talk about idea four, which is relatable vocabulary for everybody across the campus, right? You want to talk about it? Sure. So, of course, one of the ideas is that uh, a student's uh, general education, their universal GE pattern, uh, would still be focused through their area of interest, uh, which would allow us to contextualize some of that general education. And so we want to make sure that, that that vocabulary works through for the student and they understand what an area of interest is in the first place. They understand why their GE is contextualized to communication and technology or to science or to some other business, some other specific area, right? So that's really important for us that, that students understand uh, how their general education fits into the real world. I just learned what IRL was. Uh, so uh, now I know that IRL means in real life. So in real life, uh, we want students to understand uh, that what liberal arts is, right? We want to under them to understand what social sciences relates to. And, that, and that's why we need to change our own vernacular, change our own vocabulary, uh, so that students understand what they're getting themselves into. And just to touch on the uh, the other portion there about areas of interest, in, in that vein, one of the things we want to start changing the language to is the different areas we're speaking to the students about what they're plugging into, which areas of interest they're part of, the learning journey itself is it's one of the components. So we currently have come up with this list of titles. Um, they could change over time, but they're relatively straightforward. I know there's discussion sometimes about more creative terminology, and we've looked at some different terminology, um, but I know we've also discussed straightforward language like this is something that we can plug into in different ways. So onboarding might use this language in one way that persistence uses it in a different way and advising uses it in a different way, but it's all going to come back to the same place. It all lives in the same places essentially. So these are the terms I know time-wise, I'm just looking at time. Um, talk about moving everything within an arts description versus arts and humanities because that's the one thing nobody seems to be able to define accurately. What's humanities? Um, so business, <laughs> education, Health sciences, humanities, still in there, and comm studies, uh, law and public safety, science, technology, math, social behavioral sciences, and then we still do have undecided. I know it's kind of hiding. I'm not sure if, uh, I think the Zoom people can see, I'm not sure, but at the bottom we have undecided because students we know still come in not having any idea what they want to do. So we need to make them feel welcome and, hey, look, we understand you're new to the journey. We're still going to get you started. We're still going to help you on, on the path. At least we have a place to start you from that will build you into somewhere else. 
Now over to Alyssa. This is my favorite, this is research. So for idea one, we're basing off the foundation, the framework of learning, of learning communities. We know that this is one of hot, one high impact educational practice. It helps students be engaged. It helps them to persist. If they're on a certain pathway, they're least likely to stray off that pathway. Idea two is based on redesigning America's community colleges by Thomas Bailey and Shanna Smith. That one may still be on my nightstand. <laughs> not, that's not a nighttime read. Idea three is the foundation is based off the foundation framework of learning communities and Tinto's theory of retention and social integration. We know that if students are not engaged within our school, if they don't feel cared for by the institution, they're not going to persist. Why would they? They're not going to. It's going to be a lot easier for them to just drop out. So if they're persistent, they feel cared by, if they feel excited to come to classes, they're more likely to persist. And idea four is based off serial. Sierra College's area of interest up in Northern California. Their website is pretty cool. It goes back to the whole relatable vocabulary. Instead of in their pathways, instead of social and behavior science, it's people, culture, and society. That's just much more digestible. Instead of kinesiology, it's health and wellness. Also on their um, pathway descriptions, not only they have a career portion, not only is it talking about possible um, careers. It's also talking about the salary. So if you click on business, it has this little like um, scrolling thing and every second it changes. So in your area, people working as a sales manager, as a banker, as a fundraiser, makes on average about $52.88 an hour, $29.33 an hour, etc. But again, it's going back to being really relevant for students to understand. Obstacles and challenges. Um, areas we've identified are uh, faculty collaboration, curriculum analysis and reorganization, time, manpower, and counseling options. And not necessarily obstacles, but uh, support challenges in getting, getting things together. Um, so uh, with the faculty collaboration, it's allowing time and opportunity for faculty to collaborate on uh, curricular analysis and reorganization. Um, time is getting through the curriculum process. It's a time, you know, it's a timely process. It has to be, uh, go through committees, and uh, it's just not something that happens quickly. Uh, we need to educate everyone that has to share this with students, so that um, uh, all of us need to be educated, so that we can share with the students and educate them as to what we're really looking to do to help them out. Um, and looking at uh, more than one model of counseling, including a uh, paraprofessional uh, advice. Thank you. I'll take it. Yeah. We do next slide. So when we talk about resources, um, these are a few of the ideas we have for resources. So some sort of mapping software to help the students uh, track their journey, track the coursework required. We're looking at Program Mapper. There's other software out there that's being discussed. So um, that could change over time, but something that we want in place to make it more accessible than what we have currently, um, since we don't have anything currently. Uh, faculty, faculty curriculum, so student services, collaboration within all areas. We're definitely gonna be working to revise a lot of things as far as procedures, potentially. Um, how the curriculum is laid out potentially, so that's going to be some involvement as well. And um, really the communication engagement system that we have in all the different processes we're using. We really, I think the biggest resource we're going to need is to be able to access each of you out there, um, out there in TV land, and making sure that all of us are working together to make this work, whether it's feedback that things will or won't work and we need to adjust, or here's how we can address this, ideas that you might have. I think we're open to listening to other suggestions as well in the future too. You want to add on that? Okay, next slide. And then success factors. So these kind of, uh, these inform pretty much all of the different ideas we have. So I'll just kind of go through them. So when the directed success factor, it's gonna give students confidence about their academic choices and inclusion by them being active participants in the journey. I think a lot of students are very passive participants in higher education these days, it seems like. So we really want them to take ownership of their career, their, their educational career. Uh, it's focused, it's definitely gonna help them highlight choice better than, again, as we've talked about before, the buffet style of everything. We're doing a much more purposeful and intentional planning for their courses and their, their journey. Uh, they're nurtured, encourages a growth mindset and self-efficacy. 
um, and eliminates the confusion that so many students have with how to navigate the system and walk through everything. And this, again, all ties back to the other groups as well. Um, engaged and connected, we feel like are very similar within the learning journey component. So it's gonna help students identify their areas of focus. And then the valuing. So being intentional about our students, helping meet their goals, sorry. Uh, it's going to create academic instructional high points and academic turning points for the students. So all along the way, we're going to let them know that we value them as a student. We want to see them succeed. We're going to show them along the way that they have been meeting their goals along the process. Okay. Good. Thank you. Questions, concerns, kudos. <laughs> Open floor. Yes. I have a concern about. Um, one of the uh, major is undecided. Um, if the student is undecided, then if they're applying for financial aid, they're not gonna be eligible for full financial aid. And then the second thing is, if they're undecided, then how do we help them with, with the um, educational plan, whether it's abbreviated or comprehensive? Make sure to repeat the question. Okay. So the question is, if we have a pathway that is considered undecided, a student may face an obstacle in receiving financial aid. With financial aid, you have to have an educational goal. Um, at other institutions, they have used the language of liberal arts, um, all-encompassing, or social and behavioral sciences to create that pathway. Um, the focus, I believe, and I'm going to hand it over to my group member as well, would to be to not put a student in a silo, to not put a label on a student, to encourage the student to explore, explore further within that. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be a place where we would have a student as an undeclared major. It would be we would still have a declared program of study and everything within the system. It's just when we're working with the student, they would be identified on a different sort of path. So um, I can speak from experience working with students who do not have a declared major, but we've plugged them in as social sciences, whatnot in the system. We start from what might you be interested in. We start with the general education component. You know, whether a student has a declared major of science, history, whatever it is, undecided, they all need the GEs. So at a starting point, they're starting from their general education. So there will be intentional coursework for them to work towards. So we would definitely have the financial aid component as a factor. It's more how they would be participating in the campus. They're currently exploring, but they do have a purposed explore, exploration, basically. So yeah, we wouldn't leave that out for sure. No. Uh, next question. Any the other questions? In the interest of time, yes. uh, we've definitely gone over quite a, a little bit of what our group was. Uh, it's OK? OK. OK. So the question is, are we working towards, when we talk about students are, are part of the journeys in different universities coming here and taking coursework, are we creating additional relationships more than just the coursework relationships, right? That's what we're talking about. Um, do we leave that to persistence? Um, <laughs> sorry. sorry, no. So, yeah. Is that, uh, currently, students are already doing that, right? We're, we're, we're well known. Uh, as as a as, as a uh, institution for students from the CSUs to come to take courses, uh, and for us, it's really about developing relations with with the individual student who's coming to us more than us developing a relationship with the, that institution. They're already at that institution, so we can't send them back to somewhere where they already are, right? We want to make sure that they are uh, feeling like when they're here, we're giving them opportunities as well, right? to do with whether or not we're continuing to build relationships with the four-year school and the answer is yes. Yes, and I was going to follow up with that as also transfer counseling. Um, that is something that I have in the back of my mind with this. We didn't cover it specifically in here, but part of that component, that learning group, would be that back and forth dialogue to help facilitate, make sure whatever processes are needed. The articulation component is definitely in place too. So it is definitely on the list. So yeah, the journey itself is really to make sure you as an individual student have your needs met. So whether that's part of the components with the transfer, whatnot, it's all mixed into there. So yeah. Yes, that's on the on the list. Is that it? Do we have any, more last questions? any last questions? I have a question. That's okay. I guess I, I keep thinking that I know the learning journey 
it's in a way almost like the guided pathway, right? Because it is about the experience of students. And I, I think you're trying to make a distinction that it is the instructional part. So I think that needs to be clarified because when you say about the learning journey, it's all encompassing. That is everything. It's the onboarding, it's the advising, it's the counseling. So how do you differentiate that? And then the other question has to do, I'm very um, uh, aware that the majority of our students are part-time students. And so how do you pay attention to that, not necessarily as a different learning journey group, but within each learning journey, because I know and there's a lot of research out there, that their experience is definitely very different than somebody who's full-time. So I appreciate all the work, and and really excited to hear more. And yeah. I'll speak and then anybody can correct my observations on this. So the question was about the making, the, well, the journey component is much more an instructional component and then also the concern about part-time and how they would fit in. I know we've discussed the different attendance types. So part-time, full-time, our distance learning on site. So all that's considered within here. We haven't necessarily dug deeper yet because it's all worth just designing right now. But that is a component we want to make sure we address because we know our students, the bulk of them are not necessarily traditional learners on site full time. Um, so that's part of it too. Our military program students who are overseas, all that good stuff. Um, the other question about the instructional component, most of this is instructional, but it's always seemed like the program mapping group also talks directly to advising and onboarding and persistence. It's involved with all the groups. So whenever we've been looking at these, we're kind of looking at the instructional component and possibly how it's gonna plug in with the other ones because eventually we know it will. So um, I know sometimes it sounds like it's both, but it's we're looking at both aspects of it. I think we're done. Thank you. Hello. Dan's telling me to take less time because he took too long. <laughs> uh, well, hello. Uh, we are your financial stability and holistic wellness group. And um, before I jump into the introduction for our presentation today, I'd like to take a moment to let our group members introduce themselves. Hello, I'm Araba Mensa, Manager of Student Services and Partnerships in Extended Learning Division. Hi, Danny Pitaway, faculty. Hi, uh, Chin Pham, Director of Financial Aid. I'm Casey Hip, and I'm in Student Life, and myself and Ryan Boyd, who couldn't be here today, are the newest members of this group, and we're excited to be a part of it. Oh, Natalie Schoenfeld, Dean of Students. And Matt Quillen from Psychology Faculty. And Claudia Mojica, EOPS counselor. Well, let me begin with my intro here. Um, the goal of our group is to increase access and awareness about the different resources available here at Coastline and also within our surrounding community. Um, the, the, the work that our group has been doing is um, led by research. Uh, there's various reports that we have evaluated, and we've also taken a look at our local data and this information is guiding the work that we are doing within our group. Um, first and foremost locally is that we are aware that 60% of our Coastline students are receiving some version of what was called the Bach fee waiver, now known as the California Promise Grant, which covers the cost of tuition. Um, and then more recently, uh, we were evaluating the data that came from the, what is it called? Yeah, the Hope Center and the Real College Report published just recently in March of 2019. And just so that we can start off with understanding uh, why we're doing the work that we're presenting to you today, is that this report found, um, well, first of all, it actually surveyed almost 400,000 students across 57 California community campuses. 
and the, the data is recent and relevant. It was found that 50% of California community college students were food insecure in the last 30 days. 60% of respondents uh, were also housing insecure in the prior year. And of, the, of that 60%, 19% uh, reported that they were homeless in the past year. Um, in addition to this is uh, bringing into uh, focus the mental health aspect and our movement of holistic wellness. Um, we, we found that it was very interesting that California community college students in this survey um, as compared to the national, um, national reports that California community college students have a much higher rate of uh, you know, thinking about things like suicide. So all of these factors are factors that we've taken into consideration in the group that we're doing, in the work that our group is doing. Thanks. So kind of as Claudia was saying, uh, essentially we, cons we consulted with a variety of literature and reports and data that point to financial literacy, hunger, and crisis intervention as being key factors in our student population that we must address. And uh, moreover, these are essential needs, and if students' essential needs aren't addressed, then their higher order concerns, such as where they're going to study or getting tutoring help or whatever, those things aren't, aren't really at the forefront yet. If, if the basis of being a human being and being able to you know, be stable um, and have food um, aren't met. So as uh, Danny and Claudia were saying, we were basing a lot of our de ideas off these stats from national surveys, but we kept going back to the idea of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And uh, this is a psychological principle. And it's basically saying for the general human experience, you need food and water uh, in order to move up the pyramid to feel safe. So if someone doesn't have food or water, then they don't feel safe, they don't worry about it. They'll drink dirty water or eat dirty food. So if we can provide this, then they can feel safe and they can move up to belongingness or self-esteem. So if you apply this to the student experience, we wanna get them the housing and the money that they need so that they don't have to worry about things right now. So then they can think about doing well in the classroom or joining clubs or thinking about future classes or what kind of job that they wanna get. So uh, the idea that if they don't worry about now, food, housing, things like that, they can start thinking about their future. So essentially, we, we crystallized three goal areas uh, for our team. The first goal area has to do with marketing and the creation of resources and the raising of awareness about essential services that students could take advantage of. The second goal area has to do with um, basically establishing and sustaining food delivery services for our students at all sites. And the third area is about helping students become more educated about personal finance, financial responsibility, um, things of that like, which obviously is also fundamental. All right, so we have three things we want to do in terms of increasing awareness. The first is, oh, I thought you were asking me to move. The first is about creating a crisis card. So I don't know how many of you have ever seen this card around the college. So this card is really just about suicide, right? and is designed to provide students with a resource in the local community. We want to create this kind of card for resources available at Coastline. So we feel like we do a good job of connecting students potentially with resources in the community, but not necessarily resources in the college and wanting to be able to create something like this. So Leah Fleming is currently working on designing a card like that. We're hoping we will have this kind of card available sometime early 2020. The second one is the Red Folder Initiative. So all of you, when you came in, hopefully had an opportunity to pick up one of these folders. We started distributing these out when we did de-escalation training in early September. Um, the goal of this really is to ensure that folks across the college, when they interact with a student who potentially is in distress, are able to assess that and know how best to refer that student, get resources to them, and get resources for themselves in order to best support that student and themselves. Um, the third piece is around working collaboratively with the outreach and marketing team. And Dane and I currently have another partnership related to outreach, but in terms of formally connecting our groups, we are in process. 
And as part of all the goals of increasing awareness, especially for students, we wanted to have uh, an easy place where students can find easy access to all of these kinds of resources, community and college. So the idea we came up with was to have uh, maybe a canvas shell on the dashboard of the students because they go there all the time and there for their classes. It's in front of them. They don't have to ask anybody. Uh, so it's easily accessible. And in the course of our conversation with our group and other groups, uh, Persistence is working on something like this. And they were thinking of implementing that in Dolphin and connect. I know Academic Senate is working on something similar based on a program at the University of Michigan, so we want to work with them as well. Uh, but the idea is for all these groups that have the same goal, we just want to get a centralized hub of resources for uh, students to have access to. I know Claudia and EOPS have a long list of community resources, county resources, and college resources that is uh, pretty comprehensive, so we just want a place for it. And I'll be sharing about some of the initiatives that we've uh, actually already started putting into place um, in order to expand food availability. So um, we've started implementing a mobile food pantry. Um, we have a partnership with Panera Bread where they make um, surplus food available to, to us. So twice a month um, we provide that food at um, the different learning centers and we've been rotating which campuses that food has been available. So students have given some positive feedback about that and students have definitely been taking advantage of that and utilizing it. Another idea is working with the um, Office of Student Equity to establish food little little free pantries. So what that would be is a little booth or kiosk that would be um, out in, near our learning centers where people could leave food and we would stock it with food. That way, you know, in the middle of the night, if a student has a, a food need, there'd be um, some pasta or some dried um, dried goods that they'd be able to access there. So we're um, looking into possibly having that. Um, we've signed up with an organization called Chow Match. They um, partner companies and restaurants and, re and grocery stores that have excess food in order to provide that to um, community organizations who have a delivery platform. So we're going to be um, looking at how we can make food more widely available through that, um, through that partnership. Um, we're striving to expand the food distribution location, so we'll be working with the deans of the different learning centers to see if there's um, more spaces that can be made available where we can store food so that they can make it available to their students. And then um, we're going to be working with Waste Not OC. Um, there's a Ralph's Grocery Partnership that um, is in discussion phases. Uh, financial literacy. Um, it, um, there's a recent uh, survey conducted by Everfee. It, it's a um, company who provided online education. They said that uh, 35, uh, they surveyed about 30,000 students uh, um, across 440 uh, institutions. They said that 35% of the students said that they only took one um, one financial, personal financial course in high school. So by the time uh, they reached college, the other 65 percent, you know, they, they really don't know what financial literacy is. So when they have to make uh, personal financial decisions, it's very stressful for them. So our job is to uh, bring, is to educate our students, bring the information and resources to them so that way they can make informed uh, personal financial decisions. And here we talk about exploring uh, different financial literacy apps. Um, there are so many apps out there and each one is tailored to specific certain uh, student population. What we need to do is we need to look for the one that is um, meet that would meet our uh, the need of our students and then um, we uh, we have financial uh, literacy videos that the financial aid uh, they has a contract with FATV and there 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 are financial literacy videos that are right now currently housed in fine on the financial aid website we want to expand that we want to create more access. We want to bring those videos and um, make, probably post it on different locations uh, on website, Canvas, for example. And then we want to uh, increase awareness among uh, faculty and staff as well about financial literacy um, because 
the, the faculty and the staff, they are the people who, um, who uh, see the student on a daily basis. So they, if they are armed with information and resources, then they can, uh, when they talk to the student, they can, if they can identify the warnings, then they can, prov they can help those students providing, providing them with information and resources on, um, that the students need. And then um, we really want to make uh, financial literacy courses um, or information um, mandatory to the students. Because guess what? If we can have all these information out there, but if we don't make the student do it, they're not gonna do it. For example, I talked to Danny this morning. If he tells his students, okay, we're gonna have a test tomorrow and it's optional, guess what his student's gonna do, right? <laughs> they're not gonna take it. So um, we're, we're look, we want to bring, we, we, we want to bring uh, financial literacy to our students. Um, we're looking at different student activities, for example. We can uh, incorporate this in the, um, uh, in the uh, orientation because orientation, I think right now, the uh, onboarding group, they're working on that and they're, they're making it mandatory. And also learning journey, they talk about the, uh, the orientation this morning, uh, earlier as well. So um, that, that is one student activity that we can add the uh, financial literacy piece in there. Um, and then um, Claudia gonna give you an example, another activity that, that uh, we can incorporate the uh, financial liter literacy piece. Thanks, Jen. I was sharing with our group that with the work and with the findings that we have um, that we have come across with the work that we've done, um, I decided to pilot some things with my students this semester. One of the things that we're doing is that I'm including more information to them about things like financial literacy. So during the first two weeks of the of the uh, semester, we have. <laughs> We do actually cover personal, uh, personal financial management. So I have a presentation that was organized in collaboration with Schools First Federal Credit Union. Um, they helped me do this a few years back, so I've taken it and I've ad adapted it. And it lives in our Canvas space for our course, but students do get a live presentation of it. And they do some really interesting activities around wants versus needs. And the discussion gets really interesting because what one person feels that they need, another person wouldn't agree that a manicure is a need. <laughs> but for some of us, it just might be. <laughs> um, later on in the presentation, we have also teamed up with the success coaches. Um, they, are, they are piloting a presentation on financial literacy. That one has also been very successful. Students, they come in and the students uh, learn more about general opportunities available through filling out the free application for federal financial aid, which is the FAFSA, or the California Dream application for financial aid. And um, a lot of students don't know that these opportunities are out there, or they've heard about them, but they don't really know how to get to them. And then what we're doing next week is that next week is going to be all about transfer week. So we are bringing financial aid information back into that so that students can learn about what financial aid opportunities are available once they go to their Cal State or UC or even the private institutions. A lot of students that I work with with the, with the OPS, they come in thinking that because they are low-income students that the UCs are out of reach for them. But the UCs um, have a lot of really interesting programs for students that are low-income. And sometimes just, you know, putting the information out there makes them expand their own, sorry, their own uh, resources available to them. Okay, so the heart of the ideas uh, that we have presented um, are reflected here. So we want students to know that there's resources available if they're in crisis um, and to actually utilize um, those resources. Um, we want them to build their financial literacy and know that we will be equipping them with tools and giving them resources to grow their uh, awareness of how to manage their money. We'll also be working with um, food partners and community partners to expand the availability of food to students. So. We wanted students to be aware of these different components um, throughout the student life cycle. So when they're at the clarify phase, when they're researching Coastline and trying to determine if Coastline is the right institution for them, 
we hope to have information about resources, financial literacy, and food availability um, in a platform that they'll be aware of when they're in the Clarify phase. So we're going to be working closely with the outreach and marketing team in order to include some components of, of that information. So they'll see that Coastline um, is not just here to provide th them with their academic needs, but we have resources and we will um, be a, a great place for them to consider. Um, and as they're in the enter phase, we want to, to include some components of um, the resource lists and the uh, financial literacy and um, food availability um, so that they'll know that they'll be able to see it and encounter it as they're going through orientation. And just again, to expand the awareness so that they'll know that those resources and tools are available. And some of the elements that we discussed are going to grow the awareness of those resources in the college community. So as a student is going through the persist phase, they'll be come in contact with employees, staff, and faculty um, that are aware of these resources. So as they identify students in need, they'll be making referrals um, to these different um, options. And so hopefully students will be availing themselves of that. And as students prepare to go into the succeed phase, um, hopefully they would have been equipped and um, encountered and utilized some of the services um, that, the, that our group has presented. So they'll hopefully know that there are resources that are available to them in their local communities. And they'll have the tools to seek those out and utilize them, whatever phase of, um, whatever they go to after Coastline. And then our last bit. Um, so we, we, a lot of the ideas that we um, discussed and presented have the factors of success um, in mind. So as we mentioned, according to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if a student basic needs aren't met, then they're not going to be able to concentrate on their academic goals. So they won't be able to um, work towards um, completing their studies if they struggle with um, getting their basic needs met. Um, by expanding the um, access and opportunities for students to um, encounter these resources, um, the students will be more focused and will be more nurtured um, as they encounter these resources and utilize the resources. Um, if we increase employee awareness about these resources, then it increases the, likeliness, the likelihood that the employees will actually refer students to, um, to utilize these resources, so that nurtures the student. Um, by presenting the information to the student in a respectful and caring manner, then students are more likely to engage with that resource. And, and we're, we're tri striving to increase the um, awareness of these resources in the college community. So that helps the student feel more connected and it recognizes that, um, that they're a, me a member of this community and we want them to be succeed and we have tools and um, we'll, we'll position them to be able to use these tools in order to persist. Any questions? We already have lists of res oh, so the question was about resources for distance students. We have started putting together resources by county um, based on the counties where our students are predominantly coming from. Um, so currently we have resources for San Diego, LA, Orange County, and Inland Empire. Um, and we'll be looking to expand those out. marketing outreach <laughs> no 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 um, there are multiple members of our group as you can see I do want to just um, say that one we were not prepared to present today our original date was in November but Shelly called and said please please and she literally only said it twice so, <laughs> so we just jumped to it and uh, just got everything in as quickly as we possibly could. So, 
So there are members of the group here in the audience, but um, they just kind of want to stay in the audience, so it's all right. <laughs> all right, so let's go ahead and get started. So our group had multiple meetings, as most of the groups did, and here are some of the things that we produced from those meetings. Uh, we produced the goals of our group, uh, identified challenges, and proposals for marketing and outreach. So here are the goals for our group. Um, and with outreach and marketing, uh, one, we found that they couldn't really be separated. So everything really does just come together. So um, increased awareness of coastline. And uh, this is super timely right now because I just got an email today from one of our group members, um, Angela, and she told me that she was at an outreach event, I think last night at the fairgrounds for Newport Mesa Unified School District. And she said that she was there representing Coastline and they told her, oh great, you go with the ROP groups. Yeah, so there is a lack of awareness of Coastline. And this was really um, interesting because we do so much work with the Newport Mesa Unified School District. They are very aware that Coastline is a college. And so Angela fought back and they kept telling her, no, you didn't go with the two-year colleges you went with. Um, ROP. And for those of you that aren't aware, there is a coastline ROP, but they're not us. But until we figure out how to differentiate ourselves from them, we will probably continue to have that issue, um, which will then have an impact on our marketing and outreach efforts. All right, next up, strategies for sustained support for outreach efforts and program engagement. That sounds like a lot of alphabet soup. What this basically means is that as we started um, exploring outreach and marketing opportunities, we realized that faculty and some staff don't have a lot of support to attend and participate in those groups, which is where a lot of the connections and relationships happen. And so we would need an opportunity to support um, staff and faculty to attend and participate in these outreach events so that they can start making those initial connections with um, our potential learners and maybe even some of the learners that already exist. And then finally, develop an outreach and marketing strategy. Um, so this isn't for the college as a whole. Well, well, that's not altogether true. Let me back up. It is for the college as a whole. Um, however, we focused really on outreach efforts and just what we could potentially bring forward in a very short period of time so that we can go ahead and start the process. So here are some of the challenges that were identified as the group met. Um, and a disjointed outreach, really a disjointed outreach system, message, task force, group, um, um, just appearance at uh, events. It seemed like outreach was happening in a bunch of different places all over the college, but we weren't really coming together to do it as a unified effort. So that is definitely a challenge that we need to focus on and uh, clean up, um, a lack of a consistent message, and this kind of just bridges right on back to having that disjointed outreach approach is that when these outreach events are happening and the representatives from the college are there, they're basically sending different messages. And um, they're not always the same. Sometimes they don't even touch on a lot of the things that Coastline is really proud of as a college, the way that it exists. So we definitely need to come together and have a more consistent message. Identifying target markets. Who do we need to outreach to? Um, ob the obvious answer is everyone, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, we do have limited resources, so we need to work with our enrollment management plan and planning in the future as to what Coastline is going to look like, where we're going to go, and really then start targeting those specific markets where we really haven't been um, or we've lost students. Wherever those gaps are, we really need to shore those up. Next up is um, lack of communication with our alumni network. They are probably some of our best supporters. They've been here, they've been successful. We need to make sure that we have a message and a relationship with them so that they can help us on this journey of reaching out to potential learners 
and what type of messages we need to be sending through our marketing efforts. And then finally, our branding and reputation. I don't want to necessarily coat this in a negative way, um, but it is listed under a challenge. And I think the challenge is something that I've heard ever since I got here. Who are we? Who are we as Coastline? We definitely need to dial down, land somewhere, own it, embrace it, appreciate it, and move forward with it. Okay. So of those challenges, we couldn't do all of them, as was definitely um, identified in the book. It said, hey, if you've got all these challenges, great, just choose three. Okay, <laughs> we chose three. So these are the three that we thought we could really focus on and um, make um, an impact in in a short period of time. Identify that target market, that target market, who are we actually outreaching to and sending information to. Improving the reputation of Coastline, we are not Coastline ROP, but for some reason, a lot of people don't know that. And finally, um, create uniform outreach and marketing materials so that when we do go out to these events, we're all talking about the same thing in regards to the college as a whole, not necessarily program specific. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. So here are our proposed improvements based on the challenges that we've identified. Create an outreach kit. It would be very nice if every time we went to an outreach event, there was an, what we call outreach in the box. And it had all of the things that we have all agreed on are necessary when we're presenting the face of Coastline to potential learners, to our partners, uh, to other stakeholders, that we're all checking the list in the box. Everything is there so that we are all being consistent in what it is that we're delivering and sharing. Next, um, retention efforts. Utilize available technology staff and staff to increase efforts and employ retention strategies. We have a lot of things available to us. The college has invested in a lot of things, but I don't think we're pulling it all together to maximize its impact and its effort so that we can do a better job of reaching out to um, potential learners and also reaching in to the learners that we already have so that they will stay with us. Uh, the next is a new naming convention for non-CTE certificates. It's very important that it's non-CTE certificates because the CTE certificates have an entire advisory process and uh, they do the naming conventions. But I think the learning journey group talked about this a little bit as well. Like humanities, I know it's been around, but I don't know the job of humanities. Like what job do you get that's called humanities, right? So there has been a lot of discussion throughout the industry and meaning higher ed about changing the naming conventions like humanities and liberal arts. They were considering things like global knowledge. I like it, some of you like it too. Let's kind of sit with that for a little bit. Okay, time's up, next. <laughs> Increase collaboration between disciplines. And this is something we've been working on, but I think we need to work on it just a little bit more. And if we are going to market the college as a whole, we need to have a working relationship across the entire college because marketing goes out in that one direction, but we have to include everything in it. All right, so some proposed solutions based on what we just shared. Um, creating outreach task force, that outreach task force is in existence, so we took the shortcut. We kind of looked at what was already there and said, yes, let's do that. Done, check the box. This is the group that Natalie and I um, work with to further examine and explore outreach efforts. Support for uh, full-time and part-time faculty to attend and participate in outreach events. I didn't think this was really that big of a deal until we started working with faculty and sitting down and talking about this because they are really proud of the positions that they hold. They're very proud of the programs that they um, teach in, and they really want others to know about that. 
But sometimes they say, we just don't have enough money. We don't have enough time. We don't have the resources. We don't have the support that we need to go out there and really promote the programs that we have. So we need to dig deep and find a way that we can make that happen so that again, Coastline comes to the world as a whole, not just our outreach specialists, but our faculty as well. Increase engagement with community partners. This is um, very important as well. I guess everything is very important. I should stop saying that. Every time I say that, somebody just put up a finger. All right, no, no. just <laughs> this one, okay. <laughs> Um, increase engagement with community partners. I, I think it was last month, I was invited to a Project W meeting in Westminster. And if you live in Westminster, Westminster, you know that Project W is going on. And it involves a lot of things in changing the face of Westminster and making it a little bit more prominent in the community. This meeting took place at the chamber, which is almost across the street from the college, from the Westminster campus. And as I got there and started talking to a lot of representatives from a lot of different organizations, they didn't know that we had a coastline campus, steps from their doors, steps from the constituents that they actually serve. And so it was very enlightening to me at that moment that we needed to do something more with those partners that have been identified that are clearly around us where our locations exist and build um, a better relationship and a stronger engagement practice so that we can serve their constituents as well because their constituents are also our learners. Okay, identify and market employable skills in general education areas. The faculty in my area know I've been screaming about this forever. Um, the question that students often come to us with is, why should I do this, right? Why should I do this general education um, pathway in my first year? Well, the reason why is because what you learn in those courses can translate to employable skills. You don't realize that because the students or the learners are kind of just caught up in the curriculum. But there are messages in the curriculum, there are practices that they learn, there are skills that they're involved in that can easily translate from the classroom to the workforce. We need to do a better effort in making sure we're um, informing students of those employable skills that they are gaining. And once we do that, then maybe, just maybe, they will want to stick around and gain more employable skills and more and maybe finish with a certificate or maybe even a degree okay so one of the things that we thought we would do is compose a common outreach message remember we said that we were disjointed that we didn't have a common message and that there was outreach happening all over the place so natalie and i crafted a message we passed it through the vps they took a stab at it and we gave it back to the outreach task force and uh, to the outreach and marketing design team and here is our proposed common outreach message as you're reading this do you want me to read it as well no. <laughs> for people on the zoom okay here we go Coastline is a regionally accredited community college. We serve students locally, nationally, and globally by prioritizing the ability to be flexible while advancing their academic and career goals. Coastline is committed to providing students with innovative opportunities defined by where and how they learn best. We offer multiple ways for students to successfully and quickly earn a degree, certificate, or transfer to a university by completing courses and programs online at one of our multiple locations or a combination of both. Coastline creates comfortable, affordable, and personal learning experiences for every student and learner wherever they are in life. So this is still a draft, but we like it. We like it. Uh, and just so you know, we tested this out with uh, adult education. 
And uh, it really did help them pull it all together so that they can send out a message that was cohesive with what the rest of the college has to offer. So next we moved on to marketing. And here was the proposed marketing approach. And Dawn is here. And if they have questions, you have to answer them. <laughs> so Dawn um, shared with the group that Coastline needed to be seen as a prestigious institution, that it really needed to be a prestigious life event in the lives of our learners, something like Google. And so she came up and said, well, Coastline is, and we started thinking. It's a smart choice. Coastline is a smart investment because Coastline is a smart college. All right, I see some nods here, some eyebrows really going smart. up. It's very smart <laughs> and prestigious. <laughs> okay. So some of the challenges that um, we looked at in terms of marketing the college was uh, we needed to dispel the myths about um, community colleges as a whole. Uh, you know that is a challenge that we come up against a lot. And as we dive deeper into our relationships with our K-12 partners, it is something that we are really gonna have to work on because the high schools really do wanna push students towards the university as their first step into higher education, except we know that's not always the successful first step for a lot of students. Community colleges really do serve a great need for the majority of people that are seeking a pathway in higher education. Another challenge is um, explain and increase the understanding of the value of attending Coastline. We've heard over and over again that Coastline is the one-off, right? It's where you come where you just need to take one class. But the value here is so much more than one class. And we need to find a way to get that value, that message, that we have more to offer than just that one class to fill your schedule, we gotta get that out there to our potential learners and even the learners that exist with us now. So Coastline should be perceived as prestigious like Google. That was the smart stuff that we just did. Probably go back to that at some point. And Coastline should be thought of as a smart choice over an inexpensive or cheap choice for higher education. Let's come out of the financial aspect of it all because our potential learners are going to get that information. But what really needs to happen is they need to see us as a smart choice for their lives, for their goals, and for their careers. All right, so proposed focus for marketing. Focus on the return on the investment, right? Because we are a smart investment. Um, going back to the investment of those employable skills, focus on that. Focus on the ability to transfer to a four-year institution if that's what students want to do. Focus on career development. Focus on transformation and advancement in life, right? This is the holistic view of the student, meaning their transformation and advancement in life in the personal arena, in their social arena, in their financial arena, and in global knowledge, just because I like it. <laughs> we should focus on the fact that we have multiple locations to serve multiple needs for multiple learners. We should also focus on the options for learning. We're flexible. That means we don't break, we adapt. We can surround and support any learner that comes our way. We need to focus on that. We also need to focus on multiple learning communities. There are definitely multiple learning communities that all of our students or learners belong to. We also need to focus on the fact that we're approachable. Like some other colleges aren't, we are approachable. You can walk into a dean's office and have a conversation. You can walk into a vice president's office and have a conversation. And if you walk into the president's office with a gift, you can also have a conversation. <laughs> exactly. And then we also should focus on the ease of engagement with our faculty and staff. Just as easy as it is to walk into our dean's office, it's easy to address our faculty. It's easy to address our staff. 
And we just don't team, seem to focus on those components of what it's like to come to a college. So we talked about the toolkit. Here's what we propose to put in a box. So we put what's in the box. Here are some things. Branded materials. Let's be consistent in the branded materials that we put into our outreach box. Let's have our view book or at least the QR code that our potential learners can scan so that the view book is in their phone. Oh, what's this? Oh, it's Coastline. What a smart choice. Okay. <laughs> we need table and standing banners. And I can go through the list, but I don't necessarily want to read it all to you. But I do want to point out some things like the Wi-Fi hotspot. This is important. We didn't think it was important until we started talking to our outreach specialists. And they said sometimes they go to events and there's no internet. And so then all of these things that they had planned to deliver now can't be delivered. We should definitely make sure that they have Wi-Fi hotspots and power cords in the box so that they are always prepared to demonstrate and show what Coastline has to offer our learners. Our FAQs always need to be available and they need to be in multiple languages because we do serve students where English is not their first language and they may not even be learning English by the time they engage Coastline. However, someone in their home may still just be in that native language. It feels like we care about them when we need them where they are. Business cards and name tags. It's so important when our outreach specialists or our faculty or staff are at outreach events that they share with the people that are coming to the table who they are so that when those people want to return and maybe call or send an email, they have a direct line and a name that they can do that with. And so the name badges, I have one here. You all don't have these because this was a gift, but it, um, we, can, we can get them exactly. Uh, I agree. Bigger. Dr. Emerson. <laughs> but just the fact that when we engage our learners, we like to call them by name. Learners like to engage us and call us by name as well. Um, and then uh, <laughs> the last one, the checklist, so that you can check that everything's in the box. Those of you that travel a lot, you know, you got to put your checklist in your luggage to make sure that everything you plan is actually in there and it comes home with you. Just saying. All right. So proposed outreach training. So because we had so much disjointed outreach efforts going on, we thought we needed to do a collaborative training. And here are some of the topics that we thought needed to be included in the training. So general coastline message. We discovered as we talked to the outreach specialists that one, they weren't leading outreach efforts with talking about the college. They were leading their outreach efforts by specifically talking about their programs. It's great that they talk about their programs, but their programs are housed in the college. We have to talk about the college as well. Matter of fact, we have to talk about the college first. It's the priority. Next, an overview of academic programs and services. If you're out, out, out there in an outreach event, you need to have information about all of our programs. You don't have to memorize them all, but if you had something available to share with someone, it would be very helpful that they know how flexible we are and how much we are here to meet the needs of all learners. Uh, general financial aid information. Number one question is always, how much does it cost to go to college? Can I afford it? What do I need to do so that I can still eat, pay rent, and go to school? We need to make sure that everyone who is inquiring anything about Coastline has information about financial aid. Location-specific services, what can I get at Westminster, what can I get at Garden Grove, what can I get at Newport Beach, and what will I be able to get at the new Student Services Center at this location. We definitely want to make sure that our outreach specialists are engaged in really top-notch presentation skills. It's so disheartening to go to an outreach event 
where representatives are sitting at a table, a potential learner walks up to the table and the outreach representative just sits there and just shoves something at the person who is at the table. They need to know, stand up, introduce yourself, talk about the college, have these presentation skills that are very engaging because the longer you can keep the potential learner there, the better chance we have at making them a coastliner. All right, um, table etiquette, again, just some of that. The talking points, they need to know. Table organization, I didn't know this was a thing at outreach events until we talked to our outreach specialist. There are things that should be on your table and things that shouldn't be on your table. There are places where you should place things on your table and when you should bring things out and when you shouldn't. Um, strategic practices for swag giveaway. Didn't know this was a thing either until again, we talked to our outreach specialist and they said, you shouldn't just give candy just to give candy. You should have an exchange with that potential learner that's at the table with you. Because again, it's another form of engagement. Um, registration knowledge. If we don't go out there and tell people how to register at Coastline, they won't do it. So we have to be aware of the information that we give them as to how um, they can become part of Coastline. And just an overall knowledge of our outreach goals. Why are we doing outreach? What is the purpose and how does it serve the college? Um, groups to consult and engage. Marketing, obviously, we are the marketing and outreach group, the outreach specialists, that goes to say. Um, student services, faculty and program leads, student stakeholders and all partners, um, the onboarding and persistence, persistence group, and then really, now that I think about it, every single design group needs to be, um, the outreach and marketing group needs to consult, and then IT specifically. So I think this is it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think uh, on, it says now we're going to do Q&A, but I don't know who's hosting that. It's not me. <laughs> It's Josh. So Shelly can stay seated, rest her, her foot. Um, now we'd like to open up for just any general questions uh, or concerns or issues that you'd like to talk about uh, before Dr. Adrian gives us her final thoughts. Uh, anything developed for the other groups? Uh, questions that might develop throughout the other presentations? Okay, I used to work at um, as an outreach student, so I was a representative that would go out to different campuses, high school campuses, and be the representative as to talk to high school students about my experience. So I was just wondering if for the outreach, are you going to have like students also reaching out on these panels to talk to other students? Because I feel like student voice, it's more approachable for a student to talk to a student and hearing the stories personally from the student really does have a better connection. And all, when I was doing the outreach, um, we also had panels where financial aid was also there. So the first approach would be to the student. And if they had any questions regarding financial aid, we had a financial aid counselor or a person representing. So we can just direct them over there. and. I feel like that method really helps. And it, it's also another way for the students themselves to feel like they have a voice and they can represent and be proud of their experience in sharing that with others. Yes. <laughs> we have talked about um, making sure that we have an outreach team available because clearly all the things that we listed cannot be on the shoulders of one person and that institutional knowledge really does need to come from those specific areas. But we definitely agree with you. Um, we definitely want students as part of our outreach team because your voice is probably the most important voice of all when we're talking about coastline and reaching out to potential learners. And I will say this, that we did reach back to a former coastline student to help us 
with some of these ideas around outreach. Um, so absolutely, thank you for that question. Engagement practice, can <laughs> Rachel. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, for not being ready, you were ready. So yeah. kudos to you. Um, I do have a question. I'm really happy you brought up the conversation of coastline ROP. Um, I'm curious to know if that prompted a conversation about building community relations. The reason why is coastline ROP offers articulated classes in which majority of our region aid partners participate in, including our sister school OCC. And I think we're losing a lot of those students because they don't know that we exist. So they're going to go to OCC for the same program that you have, or they're going to go to Saddleback. And Coastline ROP expands not just in our local area students, but this is going to go all the way to like San Juan High School. And those students have needs for online. And I think we would get more buy-in, especially that we're talking about a cultural experience of engagement. They're going to opt to identify with their experience instead of being rolling in or Rhine Valley College and then being identified as the other because they're an online learner. Right. So, yes, um, we have discussed that we don't necessarily want to compete. I mean, Coastline ROP is a partner of ours as well. They're part of um, one of the consortiums that we participate in. But we also then need to reach out and be a partner with them as well. They can't do everything um, and we can do some things that they can't do. And but they need to change their name. <laughs> I have a follow up. So not necessarily competing with Coastline ROP is banking on that relationship. So with Perkins funding, they're allowed to have articulation credit. Right. So I'm talking about instead of saying like, okay, go to OCC, why aren't we welcoming those students to receive credit here? So we do that in very small programs okay. that um, is happening and so this is another part of our new and improved outreach plan is to make sure that we're expanding and again making sure that the college comes first and all of those programs and so that we can have that relationship with all of those partners so that we can serve learners. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. On that note. I'll let Dana just sit down and stay, right? No. Uh, we'll let Dr. Adrian come up and give some final thoughts and ideas for the afternoon. Thank you very much. And I apologize for my shoes. I'm not trying to be cool. <laughs> it's just that I am suffering from some problems with my feet. And pretty soon you might see me uh, riding one of those uh, bikes. <laughs> But anyway, thank you so much. I say, wow, right? How impressive. And I know that you have done a lot of work and will have some more work to do. But I really appreciate the work that you've gone, the research uh, that you've conducted, um, you know, the outreach that you've conducted as well, making sure that your knowledge goes beyond the expertise and the experience that you bring into the work group and to really be thoughtful and uh, really considering our students as well. And I really want to thank our students. I think that's a piece that had been uh, kind of missing in the past. And because we are primarily an online or distance learning institution, it's not always the case that we can just run into our students uh, as often as we would like to. So I want to thank Shelly and Josh. Thank you so much. I think you're the ones that have made sure that we keep doing what we need to do and keep pushing and nudging when you needed to push and nudge. And I know that you've also been uh, a great resource for the teams, making sure that in addition to the research that the teams are doing, that you're also doing that research and connecting with our coach, uh, Rob Johnstone. So I kind of want to summarize in the end by reminding us why we engage in this guided pathways movement, right? So our goal, we started this actually about four years ago now. So it's been a long time and I think we've had successes along the way. We've had many frustrations along the way. And I really love the quote that you said that I think before we get, and I don't know that we'll ever come to a point where we hand over a, a product with a bow tie, right? So it's always going to be imperfect. And that's great because it means that we're continuing to refine what we have and we're going to continue to evaluate and change and tweak and make it better. So we engage in guided pathways about four years ago now, I think, correct? 
And I think I just want to remind us that our, our goals really were threefold, three primary goals. One is to increase completion for our students. The second is to decrease or to resolve the achievement gaps, and that's the equity piece, right? We want to make sure that regardless of their background, their abilities and deficiencies or their conditions and, and environments that students of all backgrounds, various backgrounds succeed equally or in, in an equitable way. And then the third one, I think, is to really positively enhance the experience of students. And I think that's also very important. We know from research and from talking with our students, and I think for you as well, you know this, from engaging with our students, that often uh, their experience is disjointed. It's, uh, it becomes negative sometimes because they're lost in the process, which is quite bureaucratic. And that's just the nature of higher education and that's the nature of community colleges. So really improving the way in which experience the college is a very important goal. And we said from the outset that we see this as a transformation, an innovation, meaning that we can't do what we used to do. It can't be business as usual. That we have to think differently, we have to innovate um, and, and uh, think of different ways. And that it's a long process, and I think um, <coughs> Rob Johnstone, Dr. Rob Johnstone, had uh, hounded that in our heads, right? It's not an initiative, it's not a project, it is a movement, because it's something that's gonna take a while, and a movement requires that there are followers, right? That there's masses of people who buy into it, and so that's why it is a movement for us. We all need to kind of be brought in, and we all need to buy in, so to speak, and believe in what we're trying to do. And that, um, you know, it, it, we need the, the talent and the expertise and the criticism and, and the perspectives of everyone at the college and outside. I was sharing with Shelly and Josh yesterday that some of us, including Aaron, who's here in the audience, we attended a conference, which is an entrepreneurial conference. And there was this gentleman who was a very successful entrepreneur who listened to a group of educators on a panel on equity in higher education. He sat there and listened and summarized his perspectives in the end. And the one thing that he said that kind of made an impression on me is something that he said about innovation. Because he, had, he said, I don't understand higher education. I haven't worked for a community college. All I know about education was the experience that I had, that my children had and then also that he is now engaged in a work with Marshall University. Uh, but he said that one of the things about innovation that he wanted to share is that to innovate, you have to have voices from the outside, right? Because you cannot innovate if you're simply informed by your own experience. And I thought that is so true. And so I encourage all of us who are working on this project to make sure that we hear voices from the outside and that if you're in the onboarding group, that you're not only people who are involved in the onboarding experience of students. And I think that's why the notion of having cross-functional teams is really important. Uh, but I, I wanna just say that I, I wanna conclude. I have a lot of questions, um, I guess more than a response. And I know that we're gonna be meeting with Josh and Shelley, the cabinet is looking forward to it. I was really impressed, however, I think some of the things that you pointed out are not surprises, but it's wonderful that we're identifying them, naming the problem, and then also identifying solutions. And I haven't found in any of the solutions uh, or recommendations anything that we can't do. I'm a believer that unless there's something so compelling uh, that we should try it out, right? And we should not be afraid to fail if we fail, because there's a greater likelihood that we will succeed. And so again, I, I want to thank you for all the work that you've done, uh, to let you know that I greatly appreciate the work that you're doing, and that in the end, uh, your work will, will benefit the students that we serve. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. Our next presentations will be on November 8th. Uh, in this same area, and the next uh, groups will be going two to four. 
instead of one to three. And our next groups will be uh, presenting on those dates. Advising, onboarding, and persistence. Okay, so number one on my list, the one person I forgot to thank is Trustee Juan Guadalajara. And I wanted to do that. You know, there are a few members of our board of trustees that have seen us through our journey of and, and one of them is Trustee Hornbuckle, and on a busy day, she's here to again join us um, and be with us and, and follow our journey through our guided pathway. So thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everybody. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.